In this module, we're going to take a look at the psychology of human learning. And in this video specifically, we're going to take a look at what is known as classical conditioning. And our goals in this video are to answer the questions, what is learning? Or how do we learn? Or is there more than one way to learn? Now, more often than not, when we think about learning, we think of this. We think of opening a book and reading words until we gain new knowledge. Or we think of this. We may be looking at, uh, you know, thinking of it as sitting in a classroom while the teacher uh, basically grinds up knowledge and then pours it into our brains. But learning actually happens in more ways than, than these. So let's take a look at it. Let's just define what learning is. And um, a good formal definition is learning refers to a relatively enduring change in behavior or knowledge as a result of experience. Now you notice I put the important things that you need to focus on in order to really understand this and uh, memorize this information. I put it in red for you. So those are the uh, areas that you really need to pay attention to. Now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to look at what's known as classical conditioning. But what is conditioning? Well, the definition of conditioning is the process of learning associations between environmental events and behavioral responses. And there are three types of conditioning. They are classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and observational learning. And here are the three types roughly defined and uh, uh, illustrated here. So classical conditioning, remember on the left here, we're taking a look right here, and classical conditioning, that is when a neutral stimulus is associated with a natural response. Now we're gonna uh, take a look at this more in depth, so do not worry about trying to memorize this at, uh, as we're doing this. And in the middle right there, the middle image is what's called operant conditioning. That's a response is increased or decreased due to reinforcement or punishment. And last but not least, on the far right, we're going to um, take a look at what's called observational learning. And that's when le the learning that occurs through observation and imitation of others. Now, as I said, uh, in this video, we are mostly concerned with what's known as classical conditioning. So what is classical conditioning and um, how did it come to be? In classical conditioning, you know, they, they say that that's the basic learning process that involves repeatedly pairing a neutral stimulus with a response producing stimulus until the neutral stimulus elicits the same response. Now, I realize that is uh, kind of a complex definition. So do not worry, we're going to take a look at this a little more in depth as we pr proceed. Now, uh, classical conditioning says it was discovered by uh, Ivan Pavlov while he was studying, studying digestion. And now he was um, a physiologist in the uh, mid uh, 1800s to the early 1900s. Now, what Pavlov is mostly known for is in classical conditioning was the uh, salivating dog experiment. And uh, so what this is here, we're going to take a look at this step by step. And this is understanding the steps involved in classical conditioning. So on the top left frame right here, that says before conditioning, what Pavlov would do is he would have food. And then he noticed that as he was feeding the dogs, that those dogs would automatically salivate. So the food, that was known as the unconditioned stimulus. Unconditioned meaning basically um, um, untrained. And uh, the same with the dog's response when it was salivating, that was the untrained response. Those were naturally occurring. That's the, another way to think of those terms. So there's a stimulus and then there's a response. Now let's look in frame two. So before the conditioning right here, Pavlov thought, well, okay, so if the dog is naturally salivating to food, what would happen if I started to um, use a neutral stimulus such as a whistle? And uh, so he would blow the whistle and then he would observe the dog's response and there was actually 
no conditioned response. It was not salivating or anything. So that was not a naturally occurring response. The dog would just basically look at him and um, with no response whatsoever. But then Pavlov got the idea. He said, well, how about if during the conditioning phase right here in frame number three, right before the dog is about to eat the food, I blow the whistle, then serve the food while the dog is salivating uh, in um, waiting to uh, eat the food. And he would continue to do this uh, repeatedly until eventually in frame number four, I got to the point where the uh, sound of the whistle would elicit the same response as the food, but um, this time the food was not in the picture. So Pavlov would blow the whistle and then the dog would salivate. So that became known as the whistle became known as the conditioned stimulus. And then uh, the dog salivation would be known as what's called the conditioned response. Now, why? Well, look above right in uh, frame number two again. You remember, um, if you look at that a little more closely, the whistle in frame number two, before the conditioning occurred, the whistle was called the neutral stimulus. And the salivation, since there was no salivation, there was no response at all. But if you look down on fr uh, frame number four, after the conditioning, the dog became conditioned to the sound of the whistle and therefore would salivate. Now, uh, what is um, interesting is Pavlov's um, experiments and uh, research was uh, mostly concerned with animals, so animal behavior. And um, so this gentleman right here, John Watson, he actually uh, was inspired by Pavlov's uh, um, experiments, but he would wanted to uh, um, apply that to humans. And so that uh, approach, uh, applying those new uh, behavioral type um, uh, uh, type of conditioning approaches to humans formed a new approach called behaviorism. Now behaviorism, you know, that was uh, concerned with the scientific study of objectively observed behavior. So that's what's key to know here is objectively observed behavior because uh, behavior is felt that uh, psychology should be concerned only with um, observing behavior because uh, that's what could be objectively observed and um, even measured at times. Whereas things like cognitive processes and things uh, they felt, you know, could not be observed directly. And further, Watson believed that all human behavior is the result of conditioning and learning. And uh, down below here at the very bottom, you'll see it says that he conducted the controversial case of little Albert. So we'll take a brief look at what that was. And on the top here, before condition, little Albert was, was a young child um, that uh, they, what they would do is um, expose him to this little white rat right here. And uh, at first, that would, there would be no response for little Albert. He wasn't conditioned. There was no fear whatsoever to the white rats. He would smile and um, was, ex exhibited curiosity. Now, uh, one thing they did test, you know, is still in the before conditioning phase, is they would hit a steel bar with a hammer, and the loud clanging sound would actually elicit the natural reflex in little Albert, which would make him cry. He would have fear, and that was a natural reflex. Now, during condition, they combined the two of those. So um, they would have um, the white rat uh, come near little Albert, and then as little Albert was looking at the white rat, they would bang the uh, uh, steel bar against the, um, with a hammer again, making the loud sound, which would elicit that same response, the fear and the crying. And as you um, see here, those are all unconditioned responses. Those are naturally occurring responses to the loud uh, sounds. Now, after conditioning, though, they found that um, 
the white rat became was became a conditioned stimulus and because little albert associated the white rat with the sound of the steel bar hitting uh, being hit with a hammer uh little albert would automatically cry and have fear um as a result of looking at the white rat even without the sound of the um hammer hitting the bar and so hence it, down at the bottom right the far right um, he started developing a conditioned response to the white rat. Now, just one last um, example of classically conditioned uh, effect here, something that uh, a lot of us, uh, especially adults and uh, uh, students that um, we're very familiar with is just the smell of coffee can actually increase our sense of arousal and alertness and so this uh, chart right here demonstrates how you know at first things like uh, the smell and taste of coffee and caffeine itself those are unconditioned stimuli um, and they elicit an unconditioned response because uh, those are naturally occurring now after conditioning though uh, the smell and taste of coffee uh, it actually elicits a condition conditioned reflex and uh, or condition response and that is called um, was the increased arousal and alertness and that is why often even as the coffee is brewing and we're smelling it in the morning we start to feel like we're waking up even though it's known that uh, caffeine usually takes at least 20 minutes to get in our system and actually start to increase our alertness and our arousal so I know that's a lot of material um, uh, explained rather quickly. So take a breath, stay calm, keep calm, and we're just going to practice a couple of uh, uh, examples and questions here just to uh, uh, try to uh, help you to become more familiar with this material. So here's a question. So learning may be defined as blank change in behavior that occurs as a result of experience. So what do you think? So pause for a moment. Choose what you think might be the correct answer. And we will proceed to the next frame. So the answer is relatively permanent. So learning may be defined as a relatively permanent change in behavior that occurs as a result of experience. Let's look at another question here. So the best description for the unconditioned stimulus is, and I will uh, have you pause the video, look at each of these, and choose which you feel might be the correct answer. So the answer is A, a stimulus that automatically elicits a response. So that's the best description for the unconditioned stimulus. It's the stimulus that automatically elicits a response. And the term there is automatically. That is automatic, does not need to be um, uh, conditioned or trained. That's why they call it the unconditioned stimulus. Now, one more question. So in Pavlov's experiment, what was considered the unconditioned response? Now, take a moment, consider this question, and look at the words carefully because they're saying unconditioned response. So pause the video, choose your answer, and when you do, when you come back, uh, go to the next frame. Okay, so the next, uh, the answer is salivation. So in Pavlov's experiment, salivation was considered the unconditioned response. It was the naturally occurring response, um, response to the um, uh, meat powder. And so that is all for this video. So um, I would like to uh, remind you the next step is to download the uh, learning worksheet that I put in the link um, underneath this uh, video and uh, fill out the answers and um, in class, we will go over those together. And thank you for your participation.